As was in the news, we talked about uh, pipelines and uh, energy policy, and I highlighted that I'm always happy to hear perspectives uh, from across the country on various projects, but uh, my responsibility as Prime Minister is to uh, make sure that on national projects we're behaving in a way that both contributes to the economy, uh, to a secure environment, uh, to bringing people together, and mostly to creating uh, a better future for future generations. Uh, one of the, the commitments we made in uh, the election campaign, which uh, we intend to keep is that on the uh, new process of environmental assessment and uh, review process for uh, projects, uh, we would uh, both build on uh, previous uh, work done by uh, the uh, processes uh, that did exist, uh, and we will ensure that in the process going forward, uh, we take into account uh, all greenhouse gas emissions, uh, including those upstream. Uh, this is a commitment we made, and this is what we intend to bring forward uh, when we bring forward our, uh, our uh, renewal and uh, uh, repurposing uh, of the environmental assessment process and the N and National Energy Board's work. Canadians know that you can't build a strong economy without protecting the environment at the same time. It's not one or the other, and people know we do need a strong economy. Uh, and we need a protected environment. And the process that the Liberal government is putting forward is very much focused on permitting uh, a development of uh, both of those things simultaneously in partnership with concerned citizens and levels of government uh, and in partnership with industry uh, who needs to uh, you know, work hard to demonstrate uh, the impact, uh, the impacts, positive and uh, mitigate the negative uh, of their projects. Canada has just committed, um, just in terms of buyer beware, uh, a, a, an historic blunder with taxpayer dollars. The $4.5 announced by 
Finance Minister Morneau and Natural Resources Minister Carr this morning. 4.5 billion is to buy the existing infrastructure, the existing asset. Building the expansion is another blank check, but this time the Government of Canada will be writing the check to itself because there is no private sector investor. They've announced that they will try to find a private sector investor. I submit if there were private sector investors, Kinder Morgan would have found them. Kinder Morgan has been looking for investors and looking for long-term contracts ever since they announced this project in 2013, and they've come up empty. Today's announcement by LNG Canada represents the single largest private sector investment in the history of Canada. protection plan, the extensive and ongoing consultations with Indigenous communities, the strength in environmental standards, and the rigour of the approvals process, all of these factored into the decision our government's announcing today. So our message today is simple. When we're faced with an exceptional situation that puts jobs at risk, that puts our international reputation on the line, our government's prepared to take action. To guarantee the summer construction season for the workers who are counting on it and to ensure the project is built to completion in a timely fashion, the federal government has reached an agreement with Kinder Morgan to purchase the existing Trans Mountain Pipeline and the infrastructure related to the Trans Mountain Expansion Project.
advantage for Canada is that climate change knows no borders. And as we reduce and replace uh, coal-fired fired plants uh, around the world with LNG uh, done properly, done responsibly here in British Columbia and across Western Canada, uh, that is good news for all of us. These are the kinds of steps we need to take to demonstrate uh, that we are thoughtful about where the world's going and we're doing it responsibly and that Canada is a key partner in moving in the right direction. that owns the pipeline, TransCanada, is essentially saying this is not that big a deal. They tweeted a picture, uh, an aerial photograph of the leak area, and they said in a statement that the affected section, quote, was completely isolated within 15 minutes and emergency response procedures were activated. The safety of the public and environment are our top priorities. But this morning, Sandra, the pipeline remains shut down and the investigation into exactly how those 5,000 barrels of oil leaked is ongoing.
Well, in a major victory for indigenous groups and environmentalists, Canada's federal court of appeals has rejected the government's approval to triple the capacity of the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline. On Thursday, Justice Eleanor Dawson nullified licensing for the $7.4 billion project and brought construction to a halt until the National Energy Board and the federal government complete court-ordered fixes. Her ruling cited inadequate consultations with indigenous peoples affected by the project and found the National Energy Board's assessment of the expansion was so flawed that the federal cabinet should not have relied on it during the approval process. Said the report failed to address the impact the project could have on the marine environment near a shipping terminal at the end of the expanded line, or the impact of a sevenfold increase in tanker traffic on endangered killer whales in the area. Hours after the court in, uh, decision, indigenous groups celebrated the ruling. This is to slay Watooth Chief Reuben George uh, responding to the court decision Thursday. We're winning. At the beginning, I, I, I remember people saying, this is a David and Goliath fight. And it's true. The spirit of the people that I feel behind me was too big for Kinder Morgan. It was too big. Interesting twist. Just minutes after the court's decision, Kinder Morgan shareholders agreed to sell the existing pipeline and the expansion project to the federal government for four and a half billion dollars. Prime Minister Trudeau had announced in May that Canada would purchase the pipeline. This means the government now owns the project as its expansion faces years of further review. Canada's finance minister, Bill Morneau, responded to the developments Thursday. We're absolutely committed to moving forward with this project. Uh, what uh, the decision today asked us to do was to respond promptly, gave us some direction on how we could do that in a way that was going to be efficient from a time standpoint. So we will, we will be considering our next steps in, in light of that. Uh, what we really saw today was a confirmation that our government's decision to buy this pipeline because of political risks that were hard for a private sector actor was absolutely the right conclusion. Kinder Morgan has confirmed its work on the pipeline will now stop, saying in a statement, Trans Mountain is currently taking measures to suspend construction-related activities on the project in a safe and orderly manner, unquote. Well, all of this prompted Alberta's premier, Rachel Notley, to announce Alberta's pulling out of Canada's federal climate plan. Joining us from Alberta, Canada, by phone is Ariel Dranger, founder and executive director of the group Indigenous Climate Action, a member of the Athabascan Chippewa First Nation. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Well, let's go north first to Ariel. Your response to the judge's decision and what this means for First Nations' opposition to this pipeline. Well, I think first off we have to consider the fact that this isn't the first time that the federal court has ruled in favor of First Nations. In 2016, we saw that with respect to the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipe pipeline that it found that the previous administration had failed to adequately consult with First Nations. This is another case where consultation is flawed. We have to consider what this actually means. The consultation process in this country is fundamentally broken and doesn't actually uphold international standards that are outlined within the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And that is really the fundamental thing that we need to be achieving free, prior and informed consent. And we're not getting that through the consultation process and we have to look at what we're doing wrong in this country and take actual measures to, to, to correct it and that means giving communities the right to say no and that's not happening here. The matter is, is that we are not talking about moving the line towards taking aggressive uh, steps to take action on climate change, but we're talking about building a giant constructed pipeline that will carry Alberta's bitumen, which is an extracted from my people's territory that increases global climate change by adding an enormous amount of emissions annually. And we're talking about a government that's doing whatever it takes to get this pipeline built so that we can continue to create emissions rather than decreasing emissions like the rest of the world.
about $4.5 billion in this country because of uh, government's lack of ability to, to look at the fact that Indigenous rights actually hold weight. They hold their weight in this country. The court has continued to rule on our side that the government is failing to do this, and now we're out $4.5 million. I think that is the reason why Trudeau and the government is trying to save face by saying we're going to do whatever it takes to build it because now they're on the hook for the $4.5 billion bill. First, I want to say that Canada has a problem. I mean, they don't have a plan B for their economy. You have to remember that Canada is the tar sands producer and they're trying to figure out how to milk the tar sands in the face of, you know, everything is burning from California to the Arctic. The other thing is, is that, you know, they are 75% of the world's mining corporations are can Canadian. And so Canadians, the Canadian economy is predicated on this still, let's just mine it, let's suck it out, let's ship it to someplace, Staples economy. So Canada needs an economic restructuring. That's what it needs in order for us to deal with some of the, some of the problems that we're facing, you know, across the board. Now, of course, you know, we are all really pleased with this because the fact is, is that these are illegal and immoral pipelines. The, what Ariel is talking about, the idea of free, prior and informed consent. That's a UN standard. That's a United Nations standard for relations between state governments and indigenous nations or First Nations. That's not being upheld by Canada, and that's certainly not being upheld by the United States. Canada's approach is pretty much gun bloat, boat diplomacy as it is in the United States. We will starve you until you come to an agreement to host a pipeline or host a mine. That's how Canada operates. That's how the U.S. operates. But this court has said you're not going to do that. And in fact, you're going to have to get consent from these people. So it's a very, very important decision for all of us. I mean, the state of Minnesota has had this long process for six years. I've been facing down the barrel of the Enbridge pipelines. And every agency in the state of Minnesota and the administrative law judge, after reviewing 72,000 comments, of which 68,000 comments were opposing the pipeline, and as much additional written testimony, recommended against issuing a certificate of need and against issuing a permit for the route. In a rogue decision, unprecedented in Minnesota history, the Public Utilities Commission, five members said they felt like they had a gun to their head by Enbridge. The gun meaning that Enbridge would just let line three collapse and break and leak all over northern Minnesota. Therefore, they felt they had to issue this permit. We all know that that's wrong. One, you should remove the gun because you're the regulatory agency and you shouldn't buckle to a Canadian pipeline corporation that now wants a seventh pipeline, seventh pipeline across your territory. Yes, you are right. I got cited last week. We call it kind of like arrest light in downtown Bemidji with about 26 other people, mostly members of the Ojibwe Nation and church people, as well as the uh, board chair of the Sierra Club. In, uh, for opposing this line. And what we're trying to point out also is that in the final days of the final negotiations on the pipeline, right in front of us at the Public Utilities Commission, one of the PUC commissioners turns to Enbridge and says, will you pay for the police required to put in this pipeline? In other words, will you finance the brutalization of Minnesotans in order to get your pipeline in Enbridge? And Enbridge said yes. And so we have, you know, a multi-agency task force out of Bemidji now that is preparing to launch, you know, we saw an LRAD, long range acoustic device, an MRAP heading up to northern Minnesota. We are seeing the beginning of policing. And so what we're pointing out is, is that thousands of people are going to get arrested in Minnesota if they proceed with a, with a pipeline which is immoral and it is illegal and, and, and goes across our territory. I, you know, I also want to say, Amy, you may remember that two years ago on this day is known as the Day of the Dogs. Uh, that is the day on Standing Rock when you were charged and the dogs were released on our people as, as the um, energy transfer partners moved ahead and bulldozed sacred sites for the Dakota Access Pipeline. And I think that you also know that the Enbridge Corporation owns 28% of that energy transfer partners pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline. And so we are fully aware of how brutal Enbridge can be. And that's why we stood there to get arrested to say you should not do that to our people. It is wrong to do.
Gail Derringer, the executive director of Indigenous Climate Action, a member of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, recently wrote a piece for Canada's National Observer, headlined, I feel betrayed by the government and a system that's destroyed the spirit of my people. Ariel, thanks for staying with us for part two of this discussion. So the two key yeah, issues, no. um, <clears throat> the significance of um, the Canadian government buying up the pipeline, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, with Justin Trudeau. There was a big protest where people uh, were carrying signs that said Crudeau oil, as like a play on Trudeau and crude oil. Um, the government buying the pipeline, Trudeau saying that this is part of how he will be fighting climate change. And also, where you are, the Alberta tar sands. We all became familiar in the United States with the Alberta tar sands from the Keystone XL and the significance of particularly going for the oil there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, what's, what's going on here is, is it's just absolutely flabbergasting that this government, which was elected on huge promises to address both the climate and the legacy of, of uh, sort of harm to Indigenous communities across the country, is just, it's just astounding that what we're seeing here. This is a government that is taking the interests of corporations over the interests of people, and largely Indigenous people. We have for years spoken out against the harm that this industry has caused in the region. Yes, it has brought economic prosperity. Yes, it has brought jobs, but it's also brought with it contamination. It's also brought with it pollution. And it has also brought with it massive amounts of carbon emissions that we absolutely can't afford in a climate crisis. The rights of Indigenous communities continue to be eroded to, and sacrificed so corporate corporations can continue to profit. But what we're seeing now is that a government has gone from supporting fossil fuel companies that violate Indigenous rights to actually becoming one themselves. The project became too risky for a commercial entity uh, to go forward with it. That's what Kinder Morgan told us. So uh, we are now in the position where uh, we, because this project is in the national interest, national economic interest, national interest in moving forward in our climate plan and getting a price on pollution across the country, um, we've stepped in, we're going to get that pipeline built, and we don't intend to be the in the pipeline business for the long term. There is a very strong business case for this pipeline, uh, but we are going to ensure that it gets built uh, so that we can get our resources to new markets. It is too risky. It, it's too risky for a, you know, a multinational corporation conglomerate, Kinder Morgan, to take on, and yet he wants that risk to be taken on by the Canadian public. And that's just something that I just don't understand. It's risky not just because of the economic risks associated with the, the project, but it's, it's risky because of this. it has no social license. The social license for this project has been lost, and that's what Trudeau is trying to do. He's trying to buy the social license of this project by owning it themselves. But the reality is, is that the First Nations communities are not going to drop their legal suits. The municipalities aren't going to drop their legal suits. And First Nations communities are going to continue to fight for the protection and preservation, not just of their lands and territories, but of their cultural, internationally recognized rights. And Trudeau can't buy and get rid of those rights just by purchasing this pipeline. If you can talk about how you and many others in Canada, um, also joining together with many environmental activists in the United States, have made the investment too risky for private corporations, where you see now uh, the Canadian government is going to be seeking and cultivating private investors to say this is safe. You know, for the last decade, I've been involved in a campaign to to really bring the truth out about what the Alberta oil sands is bringing to the region. It's not just jobs and economic prosperity, but it's bringing contamination and a legacy to the violation of Indigenous rights. This ha We have participated in massive protests outside of the White House, outside of Parliament in Canada. We have talk in, talked to investors at shareholder meetings, financial sector meetings in Europe and, and the UK. This is a long-standing battle where we have tried to bring the fact that these projects are in direct 
direct violation of environmental and indigenous rights here in this country. And what we've seen is that companies and banks are, are not investing and they're no longer continuing to work in this territory, in this region. And this really, this attempt by Trudeau is, is really this last ditch effort to try and hold and keep together the last remaining sort of credibility, whatever there is left, of this industry. The reality is you can't get rid of the fact that this industry continues to this day to violate the environmental and human and indigenous rights of communities in the extraction zone along the pipeline corridors and brings huge tremendous risks to the indigenous communities along the coastal, in the coastal waters of British Columbia and in, into Washington state. These projects are, have massive, massive costs to our communities and we can't ignore this. And this sort of, this idea that we can just buy our way out of this problem and create the social license is absolutely backwards. Tar sands in particular, explain what tar sands oil is, why it's so difficult and expensive to extract from the earth. Yeah, you know, that's one of the biggest things that we're not getting investors in these projects because tar sands itself is not your conventional sweet crude oil. It needs to be refined multiple times in order for it to be marketable and sold on the markets. Um, but before that, the extraction process itself is highly energy intensive and highly water intensive because it's not oil. It's not like your sweet crude oil. It is like peanut butter. So it's really thick and sticky. It's mixed with clay and other minerals. And to extract it, they have to take massive amounts of fresh water from the water systems and in this case the Athabasca Delta water systems and then they have to superheat it mix it with chemicals to sort of separate the oil from the sand and then once they do that it's still not it's still not ready it's got to be refined again and again and they ship it through these pipelines and it's much more corrosive uh, and it's heavy it's like a heavy oil that literally sinks when it hits water it doesn't float like your conventional sweet crude oil as well um, and the other byproduct through the extraction extraction process is that using this massive amount of water that's superheated, which we use natural gas to do that, they then have to create these massive tailings ponds that are associated. So this byproduct, this dirty water, is highly toxic. So toxic to the point that in 2008, a flock of ducks of 1,606 ducks landed on one of these open tailings that look like lakes and cover the landscape to the tune of 260 square kilometers, landed in one, and they all died. Animals die every single year landing or trying to water in one of these tailings ponds that litter the landscapes in Alberta. We don't have a strategy in this province for the cleanup. We have a legacy that is going to last hundreds of years in this region, and it's the First Nations communities that are going to bear the, the brunt of the consequences of the mismanagement of this resource. Uh, Ariel, um, we just have this tweet from Bill McKibben. Meet the planet's newest oil executive, Justin Trudeau. The new face of global warming. And Nermeen, you have the piece in The Guardian that Bill McKibben wrote. So in this piece in The Guardian, uh, McKibben writes, in case anyone wondered, this is how the world ends, with the cutest, progressivist, boy bandiest leader in the world going fully in the tank for the oil industry. <laughs> he, he concludes the piece by saying now it's Trudeau who owns the razor wire, Trudeau who has to battle his own people, all in the name of pouring more carbon into the air so he can make the oil companies back at the Alberta end of his pipe a little more money. We know now how history will remember Justin Trudeau, not as a dreamy progressive, but as one more pathetic employee of the richest, most reckless industry in the planet's history. You know, Bill hit the nail right on the head. This is exactly it. I, I really hope that this opens up the eyes to the rest of the world that Justin Trudeau is not that pretty boy progressive that he's painted himself to be. The reality is that this isn't the first mark on his on his term. One of the first things he did when he was elected was to approve massive LNG ports in British Columbia. Again, absolutely counter to his promises, not just to indigenous communities, but to climate change. We're seeing this now, not just the approval of the Kinder Morgan, but the buying out of Kinder Morgan. And we're seeing continued approvals in Alberta's oil sands. There's a battle raging on the sacred land. Our
brothers and sisters had to take a stand Against us now for what we all been doing On the sacred land there's a battle brewing I wish somebody would share the news I wish somebody Taking what we give away Just like what we call Indian givers It makes you sick and gives you shiver I wish somebody would share the news I wish somebody And ripping the soil Where graves are scattered And blood was boiled When all who look Can see the truth But they just move on And keep their groove Justice always fails I wish somebody Would share the news I wish somebody Would share the news I wish somebody Would share the news Imposters in our neighborhood Across our farms and through our waters All at the cost of our sons and daughters Yeah, our brave sons and beautiful daughters We're all here together fighting poison of day
Uh, it's about the decision that was made, but how that decision was made, because basically a flawed process. Uh, when you have the National Energy Board making the recommendation up to Cabinet, it doesn't take into consideration an analysis about rights, you know, treaty rights, Aboriginal rights, and these are constitutionally enshrined rights. So basically a flawed process. And the decision that was made, you know, something that the AFN has always said, we're not rights entitled holders, but we support the right to self-determination, and which is basically the right to say yes and the right to say no. So we have chiefs on both sides, and we just got to find that happy medium between the economy and the environment. And that's going to create basically dialogue, a really constructive dialogue that's needed right now. We have an upcoming Chiefs Assembly next week, so we look forward to that. That's a great opportunity to hear the both sides on it. It's basically coming back to the, the whole decision being, the process is flawed. You know, we have duty consult and accommodate. We have free, prior, and informed consent. If anything is going to get done, you need to involve Indigenous peoples. It's about balance. You know, we say we have rights, but we also have responsibilities as Indigenous peoples. And one of the biggest responsibilities we have is to protect the land and water. So anything that's going to be supported in terms of the economy, you know it's going to be done in a very safe, sustainable way. Because that right will always trump anything else, protecting the land and water. And it's like globally, the whole point we keep saying is, as a society, we are too dependent on fossil fuels. So we need to make that smart transition, and it's a phase transition to clean energy, renewable energy, and that we know is going to take some time. So we've got to find that sweet spot, and it's going to create dialogue and cooler heads to be brought to the table to find that sweet spot.